G'day mates, it's Bee Buster here. So before the video begins, I would like to give Raid Shadow Legends a shout out for sponsoring this video. And guys, just take a look at how aesthetically beautiful this game actually is. So Raid Shadow Legends is one of the most ambitious RPG projects of 2019 and has just been released. It provides an incredibly immersive experience, the best I've found on a smartphone in fact, and it can only really be compared with the biggest PC and console titles. But the best thing about this game is that it's totally free. It also has all the features that you'd expect from a brand new RPG title. Amazing storyline, awesome 3D graphics, giant boss fights, PvP battles and hundreds of champions to collect and customize. I honestly never expected to get this level of performance out of a mobile game. And just look how crazy the level of detail is on these champions. Also guys, Raid Special Launch Tournament is happening right now and is getting big real fast. So go to the description of this video, download Raid only through my link to get 50,000 silver immediately. And the best part, you'll also be automatically entered into their special launch tournament, where you can compete with me and other players for crazy in-game prizes and physical prize packs with collection edition figurines, power banks, t-shirts, and plenty more. And any winners, I'll get them delivered straight to their house. Good luck guys, and I'll see you there. Alright, so this story is going to be about two encounters, as I feel that they're probably related. It's about aliens, I think, but like many things that happened to me, I really have no idea. So Newfoundland is an alien hotspot if the stories that I hear are any indication. Almost everyone that I know has some story about when they lost huge chunks of time and were missing, usually for about a day, but it can go as high as a week. I've never heard any violent encounters, but a lot of I was frozen and couldn't move for a bit due to light from the sky once. It's a pretty good assumption that if aliens do exist, they stalk my family. My dad has stories about being frozen on beaches, being watched in his sleep, and a weird story about the stars changing configurations. My mum has stories about meeting aliens, and she even has a few accounts of what they look like. I might tell those stories one day, but I feel like this is a good introduction to the types of encounters that my family's had. So it all started when I was about 13. There's nothing overly remarkable about me, other than being in a military family and I was more precious than most. At the time, I was living in my dad's hometown, maybe a solid kilometer up a hill I suppose. My house was a raised bungalow, meaning that all the first floor windows were about 10 feet off the ground. And my window faced the front yard and it was probably the only one that didn't have some kind of bush in front of it. Basically that means that I had a good solid view of my outside. Now one night, I remember being woken up fairly abruptly around 1 in the morning I'd say. Not unusual for a 13 year old, so I thought I'd go and get a drink, and probably pee and then just go back to bed. Except, when I tried to move, I just couldn't. Some people describe the feeling of a, an overbearing weight that prevents them from moving, but this, this wasn't that. It was like my whole body was asleep, complete with the tingly feeling and utter lack of ability to move. I wasn't sleeping in a weird position, and aside from having maybe an extra blanket on the bed, I couldn't figure out a reason why this was all happening. But the only thing I could move was my head, as my neck felt asleep, but not enough to completely prevent movement like the rest of my body. So I flopped my head to one side, and that was when I saw it. In my window, roughly in the middle, was a disc-shaped object. It hovered maybe a foot away from the glass and didn't move. Now, this is remarkable for anyone who's been to Newfoundland, where 40 km an hour winds are the norm basically every day. The disc was maybe 3 feet in diameter and the better part of a foot tall, and it let off this low grade, almost LED like hue. It reminds me of those horrible blue Christmas lights. The thing had three thick, prominent ridges on what I assumed to be the front of it, which was facing me. 
From the middle one came a red light, and the thing didn't have a lens, it just kind of emanated from this thing. It split into a wide vertical pattern and was scanning my body. When I moved my head, the disc was beaming around my belly button area, and as soon as my head flopped with maybe a second or so delay, it moved the scanning laser to my eyes. But for maybe five seconds, I just stared rather uncomfortably into this horrible red light and it kind of burnt. I wanted to close my eyes desperately as it felt not dissimilar to staring into the sun, but they just couldn't move. I tried to yell as I recall holy hell, but I couldn't say anything. And much like staring into the sun, you see little else. After the five or so seconds though, the light turned off and I could just make out that disc object flew off down the road towards the ocean. I was awake for maybe ten or more seconds before I just fell asleep. For full context too, this happened in about 20 seconds, give or take. I need to point out too that this happened in 2003 in rural Newfoundland. At the time there were no such thing as drones. In fact, drones were the terrifying flying machines the US were sending to bomb the crap out of Iraq at the time. I had only recently seen them on TV as those big white plane looking things and I have no real explanation for this other than possibly aliens I suppose, but I tried to talk to my family and classmates about it, but they mostly called me a loony and just laughed at me. Eventually that night passed from me though trying to tell people about it. No one will believe me, so why bother, I thought to myself. A month, maybe two passes, and my life just carries on as normal. The only real difference, though, is that I just became terrible at math all of a sudden. I was a top student in my class, always pulling best grades for most of my school life until that point. Given the math isn't all that hard, but at this point, I just really started to suck. My grades went from 90s to 60s, often 50s, and sometimes even failing in the math that I was able to do not even four months ago. No one was concerned for some reason, but that was a frequent theme in my teen years, so I was now just the kid that had fallen from grace. Still had amazing grades and everything else, just never again in math, which was really weird. Anyway... So one night, I remember being woken up, again my body feeling like it was asleep, and again I had some control over my neck, but I remember this like, I remember a dream kind of, but way too many details for it to be normal, but I'll get to that. But the first thing that hits me though is the blinding white light. It was coming from outside my window, brighter than stadium lights, and coming from who knows where, but I knew it was close to my house, and all I heard was a low growling hum coming from outside. In my room were two of those discs that I'd seen before, shining a wide red light all over the room which dampened the sheer brightness of the light outside enough that I couldn't see anymore. And then I see one of them. It walks into my room and I remember being scared-ish but largely indifferent to be honest. It was easily over 12 feet tall and was uncomfortably skinny. Its arms and legs were way too long for the tiny torso it had, about the size of maybe a child. They were multi-jointed in at least seven places that allowed it to fold up its arms and legs enough that it could fit in my room. I have no doubt that if it were to fully extend all of its joints that the thing could easily top 20 feet. It had hands which had too many joints in its fingers, way too many fingers and no thumbs. They were in a half circle around its pretty round palm and generally it was pretty unsettling now that I think about it. It had a head, a huge head, but it lacked any real eyes except for maybe tiny pinpoints where a massive socket would otherwise be. It had no nose, no hair, no real chin and two holes where cheeks would be. I'm guessing that that might be a mouth, but hell if I know. The head was thin because, of course, the whole thing was thin and resembled somewhat of an oblong pancake, I suppose. The whole thing had white skin with a grey undertone, or what I assumed to be such given the light of the room. The creature, though, held out its hand and instinctively I held it back. It walked me out of my room, stark naked, and was leading me to my living room. When I got into my hall, I see all the doors of my house are open and... There are dozens of these things just sort of mulling about. 
I remember one looking in our linen closet, one walking into our basement, and another unscrewing a light bulb or something. All over the house were the discs that gave everything that faint red tint, and the huge stadium lights from outside making it look like broad daylight, but with a slight red tint. In the dining room was my mother, also stark naked, kind of just standing there as two of these creatures were in my kitchen doing something. When lying on the couch in my living room was my dad, again naked, with three of the creatures looming over him with a bunch of weird tools in their hands. I can only assume, too, that they were doing some kind of procedure. I remember asking, where's my sister? To which I get the reply, outside from the creature holding my hand. I'm still unsure, though, if I heard this from inside my head or if the creature said something out of its uncomfortable holes, but I accepted that as good enough of an answer. As I walked by my dad, I could see the creatures were fiddling with my dad's junk, poking and prodding it. I remember being concerned as I knew my dad had just had a vasectomy, but again, I just got the feeling that everything would be okay. The creature I was with placed me in the corner of the room, facing the wall, and I sat down cross-legged with not much issue. The creature then left, and I was there for about a minute or so. All I can remember from that time is a few details. Above me was one of the discs shining its broad red light, but I had the faint blue as well giving my vision an odd hue. And the only other distinguishing feature that I remember is the silence. The piercing and utter silence, only broken by a soft low growling hum coming from outside. I remember them waking up back in my bed, no worse for wear, and all I think is, damn, that was a weird dream and went about my day. The only difference though is that I had and still have a small lump on the back of my neck the size of a split pea. It comes and goes and sometimes I feel it and sometimes I don't and a few times I've squeezed it and some dry kind of powdery substance came out. I just assumed it was weird pus but if it ever happens again I might try to get a good look at it. A few years go by and me and my dad were chatting and we got on the topic of aliens somehow, one of his personal favourites. I tell my dad about the multi-jointed creature thing and before I can get to the point where I reach the living room, he says, I had a dream just like that. A bunch of skinny white men with hoods were cutting my junk, red hue over everything and I remember seeing them sit you in a corner and you just sort of stayed there for a bit. Crazy dreams, hey? I asked if it seemed real to him and he said, well yeah, I had those kinds of dreams since I was a kid. The white guys in the hoods never do anything interesting. This was the only time. Our brains are weird, aren't they? I've brought it up a few times since then, but I just really don't get a whole lot more than what I've told you. My sister has somewhat of a similar story, but she also remembers like three seconds of it. I personally have about two minutes I'd say and the best guess that I've come up with is that it's aliens. But like I said at the beginning, this is far from the only time that I encountered these creatures. I'll save that story for another day though and I hope you guys enjoyed this. So, before I really get into this, I just want to note that I was probably about nine years old when this happened, and I'm about to move back to this very rich in history concerning Native Americans and the Revolutionary War town that I lived in. So I recently moved into an old 1940s craftsman house in a small Maryland town and the only thing that I knew about the place was just some details about the house that I probably shouldn't have even known at my age then. I was always a kid that really enjoyed learning about the paranormal and cryptozoology, dinosaurs, so when I found out that the older owner of the house was a doctor that died of a heart attack there, I was saddened for the doctor but excited that a ghost might actually be in the house. But looking back, that was the least of my worries. So it all started when I used to play in the yard that summer. I used to hang out on an old tire swing that was there when we first moved in. And I noticed that there was some sort of gully, like a thing that appeared to be filled up. 
and when I asked my mum to take a look at it, I then learned that it was actually a creek that got filled up. We were both confused as to why it was filled up in the first place, but I was soon to find out. Shortly after that, I started digging around the creek thinking that I could dig up dinosaur bones, but I found other things. My mum and grandmother were kind of startled and yet again baffled that I started bringing small toys to them from the filled up creek. With things like marbles and plastic letters. But we didn't think much of it until one day I brought them a stone arrowhead from the filled up creek. It was an actual stone arrowhead too because we'd even bought them at a local pawn shop in town that collects and buys off artifacts like that from the area but... I actually wanted to keep it because it was, well, my first archaeological find, and I kept digging them up that day. When night came, I had to sleep in my grandmother's room since my bedroom was still being painted upstairs. I lived with my mother and grandparents at the time, and they were all heavy smokers, so they gathered up on the porch to smoke. I also had two dogs and a bird. The bird was in the parlour, far from my grandmother's room, and the dogs followed my grandparents and mum out onto the porch where they smoked. Now, I was trying to sleep that night, but something just felt off. The windows were open, and it was really warm in the room, but there was no breeze coming in. The night was just dead still. My grandmother had this uh, fake palm tree on this tall end table right next to the window in front of my bed and I was just about to close my eyes until the tree just started to shake audibly. Like there was wind flying through it or someone was shaking the branches but there was no one there and there was definitely no breeze. I really thought it was just my imagination at first but it just kept shaking so I screamed for my mum at this point. She burst into the room and the palm tree stopped shaking and I told her what happened but she suggested that I was dreaming and I needed to just go back to sleep. So I tried to sleep but when she left it started shaking the same way again and I screamed for her again. She got angry with me and yelled at me and then left the room. Things seemed to be fine too until the room just went cold as if there was an air conditioner the window let in no breeze and the house was too old for central air but I wasn't going to complain since it felt nice but my nerves were definitely on edge. I tried to go to sleep until I heard a light and audible female whisper from across the room and I shot up and sat up and looked around for who was whispering and I saw her. I still have nightmares about her and she had to be as tall as my grandmother, about 5'2", and she was just stood in the corner of the room. She was still, dead still. She wore a long black dress with some sort of print on it, and her skin was so pale grey that it could have been white for all I know. Her eyes were huge along her normal face, and her eyes were completely white, pure white. There was nothing else in them. Her hair was long and black, and... A little frizzy or matted, I suppose. I couldn't see her feet from where I sat, but we made eye contact for what seemed like forever, though it was probably just a solid minute. I was too scared to scream or move or do anything, but when she opened her mouth a little as if about to speak, I just dove under my covers and I tried to hide. It took me a few minutes to muster up the courage to scream, and this time everyone came running into my room. The dogs looked uneasy, they were looking for something in there and my mum asked what happened and I told her that I saw a woman and she looked at the arrowheads on the nightstand and just shook her head. My grandmother looked at them too and said to get rid of them right now. And so my grandmother went to bed with me that night and in the morning I buried the arrowheads and all the toys. Nothing ever seemed to happen again after that and I never saw the woman again either but... It's an experience that I'll never forget. It was a Sunday, early in the morning. I live in the suburbs, but my parents own a farm that I enjoy going to because I get to see my dog. Her name is Molly. She's a mutt, but she's not a tiny dog by any means, and at the time I felt pretty safe around her and would often take her for walks in the forest that was nearby. 
So the day started off like any other. Me and my dad got in the car, drove around for a while and arrived at the farm. I immediately get out of the car and hugged Molly. My parents always got angry when I hugged her since I'd smell like her for the rest of the day. I put her leash on and asked my dad if I could take her for a walk. He always thought that we would just go down to a road and back but I always found it more interesting to take her to the forest. I always felt like a certain kind of peace and relaxation was there that was unmatched by pretty much anything else. So we took a turn and headed to the forest. Usually when we got there I'd take her off a leash so that she could explore on her own. Most of the time I'd carve my name into the trees or look for anything interesting really. I was playing baseball with some rocks and a wooden leg, presumably from an old table, and then I heard it. Molly was barking at something. This wasn't usual for her when we were in the forest too. I thought that it was a fox or some other animal, so I quickly grabbed the wooden leg like a weapon. I knew that if it was a fox, uh, I wouldn't attack it, but I had a sense of security while I was holding it anyway. I called out Molly a couple of times, but she just kept barking. But this was very strange for me, since she always came to me when I called her. I followed the sound of her barks, though, and stumbled across a scene that, honestly, I'll never forget. There was a man, probably in his late fifties, half-naked, carrying a large machete in one hand and holding moonshine in the other. This was the first time that I stumbled across someone in the woods, let alone someone half naked and carrying a big ass machete. He was completely ignoring Molly and hacking away at the ground for some reason. I didn't really know how to handle the situation if I'm being honest. Even now I have no idea how I would handle it. But I asked in confusion, Sir, are you okay? I don't think I understood the seriousness of the situation at the time, but he turned around, revealing his face. And he had some of the clearest blue eyes that I've ever seen to this day. And I could see them so well because they were completely open wide. He looked at me and said, Come here, boy. Look what I've dug up. I was afraid that if I didn't listen to him that he would start chasing after me, and that was something that I wanted to avoid at all costs. I got closer, but kept a good distance still. I didn't see anything except for an empty hole. He returned to hitting the ground with his machete, occasionally taking sips from the bottle. And I used this window of time to get my dog and start walking away slowly as to not notify him that I was leaving. But then I took one final glance at the man and his head was dug deep in that hole. I was so intrigued though that... I just kept watching. I know that this was stupid of me, but I was curious. He finally got up from the ground, and I was shocked when I saw him carrying a bone in his mouth. I have no idea what animal it belonged to, if it even did belong to an animal. I had just seen enough at this point, though, and started sprinting with my dog. As we ran, I heard him laughing, and then I saw something flying from the corner of my eye. It was that damn machete. I heard him yell, damn it, and this made me run even faster. I know the forest really well, so I wasn't afraid of getting lost, and I ripped through the branches and the bushes until I got out of the forest, but I didn't stop sprinting until I arrived at the garage where my father was testing out lights on our tractor. And stupidly, I didn't tell him a single thing about the man since I was afraid that he'd get angry and wouldn't allow me to walk Molly anymore. Needless to say, though, I never went back to that forest alone ever again. From March to May of 2017, I toured Europe with my mum and sister. I was 16 at the time and we were Australian. I'm the classic stereotypical Aussie teenage girl, blonde, blue or green eyes, tan. I'd say I look pretty average if it really matters, but yeah. So our trip of course happened to collide with all of the attacks and we drove down to Westminster Bridge the week after the attack, saw all the memorials, we visited other places a month after the machete attacks and we boarded the subway the day before a bomb was let off on it and we'd taken the exact same route at the same time. And due to all of this we were all on very high alert for the entirety of our trip. And I think that that explains my behaviour in this story too. 
So our trip mostly consisted of us staying in a hotel, apartment and a lodge for two or three days, then driving on to the next place. I can't remember where this particular hotel was, and it's important to know that I'm a very big go with the flow person, so I didn't really know where we were. I didn't care if it was an apartment or a hotel, I just knew that on that particular day I was sick and I decided to stay instead of go out into the freezing cold and get sicker. So my sister and my mum went without me. About 10 minutes after they left, I heard the door open. I'd been watching a movie on my laptop and didn't pay much attention to it. I figured my mum had forgotten something and came back for it. Although the time lapse seemed a little long for that. But it still seemed like the most likely thing, so I didn't think too much of it. But she didn't call out to me, and I wondered if she thought I might be asleep, or if it was a maid service. Usually they call out, hello, is anybody in there, when they enter, but maybe they figured that we were already gone. So I waited, getting more and more concerned with every passing minute. I wasn't on high alert, but I already am a very paranoid person by nature, and although I tend to diminish my own paranoia, in the moment, all I was thinking is, oh my goodness, you're so pathetic. Do you really think a robbery or something would take place with you in your room? I also, admittedly, succumbed to that paranoia a lot. I figured it was most likely just a landlord, though, if it wasn't a maid service to begin with. Again, I didn't know if we were in a hotel or an apartment complex. So I did what any antisocial, anxiety-ridden, paranoid teenager girl would do, and I hid in the closet. Even at the time, digging myself beneath the bundles of blankets that they shoved in there, I thought I was being ridiculous. So ridiculous, in fact, that I took a snapchat of myself in the closet with a caption along the lines of, is it a robber or the maid service in my room, a day in the life of my name. But my friends thought that I was an absolute idiot, and I remember one messaging me and laughing about, oh, maybe it's another attack. But I didn't answer her, I was too focused to try and figure out what the hell this person who'd come in was doing. It sounded like they were going from room to room, raiding the place almost, and I heard things being moved around, and not in the way that they would be if someone was trying to clean underneath or something like that. It was just really rough. Anyway, I heard doors open and close again and again. They even came into the room that I was in and rummaged around for a while. I honestly don't know if they looked into a closet. I'd left the door open a bit, enough for them to peer into because it had caught on something and closing it would have caused more noise, but I was hidden beneath the bundles and bundles of thick blankets. I'm a girl of very small stature, so I pretty much wouldn't have been noticed. And finally, it sounded like they left. I say they because, well, I strongly suspect that there were two people. The footsteps and the movements just didn't really match up to one person, but I still thought it was most likely my mum and I was just paranoid and hallucinating. I waited a good 15 minutes after they left before I climbed out of my hiding spot. I was pretty unnerved, but I came out and checked our suitcases. We had left them open in the living room, bearing our money and passports for all to see, and pretty much nothing looked disturbed. That is, except the passports maybe, I think. My mum keeps all our passports in a Ziploc bag. The Ziploc bag had been opened and two passports had been pulled out. One was half in the Ziploc bag, like they'd opened it enough to check whose it was and then ignored it. The second was left on the top of the clothes, which meant that someone had picked it up and looked through it. I opened it and it was my one. My mother came home several hours later and I asked her if she'd come back about 10 minutes after leaving, if she'd come back to get something that she'd forgot and she just looked perplexed and said no, and I was honestly pretty shocked by this. I asked if we were in a hotel with a maid service or if she called a maintenance man to come by and forgotten to tell me. She started looking suspicious and then said no and asked me why. I asked her if we had a landlord that might have come by and she said no, and then it hit me in that moment that an honest-to-God stranger had been in my hotel room while I was still in there hiding. Still, I didn't feel like making it a big deal. Maybe they gave someone the wrong keycard and they didn't realize until they went through my room and looked through our passports to see who was staying in the room or something. I mean, after all, nothing had been taken. 
So I decided to go with my mother for the rest of the day, and still unnerved about the experience, we were in the town chatting with some locals who asked where we were staying. We told them, and they just looked horrified. I wasn't there for the conversation, but according to my mother, they told her, I don't want to frighten you, but I think you should leave that place immediately. We here have a suspicion that they're trafficking girls from there, and a lot of backpackers go missing after visiting there. Well, we left that day and my mother didn't tell me the reason until we were in the car. For someone to have gotten into my room, they would have needed to be allowed into the main doors by an employee, or have a keycard themselves to have access. Then, they would have needed to have had my keycard to my room. And, I also suspect that maybe someone was watching on the CCTV cameras and saw my mum and sister leave and realised that I wasn't with them. It gives me chills to think about it, but it's never really kind of just hit me, considering even in the moment that I kept thinking that I was the biggest idiot in the world for hiding in a closet because I was scared of socializing with a maid service. But I think that the fact that I kept thinking that I was so dumb and paranoid and dramatic for all of it throughout the experience might have just saved my butt. It meant that I kept a level head and listened for clues, that I didn't have adrenaline pumping through my veins and clouding my thoughts, and honestly, I think that I was pretty lucky. Years ago, when I was about 13 or 14 years old, I went on a trip to celebrate Easter with my mum's family. It was a tradition for us to have a picnic in the middle of a big field about 40 minutes from my grandma's house. This field is basically in the middle of nowhere in rural Mexico. That day, my cousins and I got really curious about a small hill that we could see from the field. It always caught our attention because it looks like a giant took a big bite out of it or something. It used to work as a rock mine several years ago. But anyway, we decided to go investigate, so we left the picnic, walked for about 20 minutes until we crossed a road and went up the hill. Once we were there, we started looking for a way to trespass a metallic fence that kept us from going into the actual mine, and eventually we found a hole in it. My cousin was recording with a cell phone as we were making jokes and acting like normal cringy teenagers when suddenly she just froze and whispered, Hey, there's something in the rocks. And... She pointed her camera to the rock wall behind us. At first, I thought that she was joking, but something about her expression just seemed off, so I turned back and there was a human dog-like hybrid looking at us from the hole in the rocks, about 20 or 30 meters above the ground. It had pink and pale and wrinkly skin and a long snout, long ears, wide eyes and hands with long fingers. It had no hair and it kept still just watching us. After what felt like an eternity, the weird creature finally went into the hole again and we started running back to the picnic spot. We showed the video to our family right after being scolded for going so far without saying anything to anyone, but you could barely see anything on the video. After all these years, I still don't know what that thing was and I still get goosebumps when I think about it. The mother of my best friend had a brother working in the mine in the 70s or so and she claims that he and other workers died there but the families never got the bodies back. Apparently too, rocks collapsed multiple times killing people working there and made it really difficult to retrieve the corpses. Or that's what the owners of the mine said to all the families involved anyway. And after a few incidences, they just decided to close the mine for good. I think that throughout my life, I've had my fair amount of bad meetups with people. I believe that it's probably my fault in most cases because, well, I try to be polite and kind and don't realize that such a behavior could turn out with bad results in the future. But one time, I thought that there was nothing that I could do. I was trying to pass the exams for the Fine Arts University and in order to get in, which is extremely hard... People have been taking these exams from 5 to 10 years on average to pass. You had to have some basic knowledge of drawing technique with charcoal and colours, as well as be good in composition and other stuff regarding your art. So, in order to get good enough to pass, you essentially have to go to drawing prep schools specifically created for these exams. 
but most of them, if not all, were too far away from my hometown, so my father thought to send me to a German artist who has done commissions for him, living in a small town away from our own. He was around 60 and really good at his work, but because the distance was still too big, I had to go and live at this town and he would privately tutor me. We would have courses for four to six hours a day, every day at the house that I was living. And at first it all seemed well and good. But since I knew what was needed for the exams, I was asking him to focus on charcoal and composition, but instead he was teaching me random things which were pretty much not relevant with my exams. These kinds of things needed lots of materials too, other than paint, like construction composition. He would leave to grab the materials on regular basis, but when he would come back I would notice that he was always actually drunk, reeking of beer. I immediately realized then that this was pretty much leading nowhere and I just wanted to try and persuade him to do what I was in need of for my exams. At first everything seemed nice and normal except the issues mentioned above but as time started passing I started meeting people including a neighbor next door who was a marine cop and the two friends that I've made at the time noticed too that his car was moving in town and that he was drinking in his parked car many times. At the time, I just thought that it was something that I couldn't poke my nose into and silently just tried to let it slide. But gradually, he became more intense. He would be drunk and start telling me about his life and touch my shoulders and just be too close to me physically when I was drawing. I was trying to keep a distance and still talking to him in plural. It's pronounced out of respect here, but he would just lean closer and closer. At one point, my friends took notice of something really strange too. Wherever I was going, his car would be parked just a few blocks away from where we were, every single time. Since it was a small town with only one main street at the beach, I reassured them though that this was probably just a coincidence. But then, one night, I woke up from the barks of the two stray dogs that I've adopted while I was there. I woke up and went to check what was wrong and I saw his car parked across the street in front of my house. Since it was too dark I couldn't see if he was in there or not but I certainly got pretty freaked out. I tried to calm down my thinking that he was probably at one of the bars which were really close to my house just drinking. But note too that the house that I was living in was not on any floor and that the enclosure on my small yard was more of a decoration rather than practical and that the house was on the main road at the beach but a little further away than the actual town. So at this point I started to become more alarmed about him and he gradually started to become more intimidating as well. Because I've been a victim of harassment before, for six years, and my mother and stepdad accused me of being an attention whore and didn't want to believe me until I was sent to the hospital with grave wounds after a rough night, I've pretty much lost my faith and stopped relying on my family whenever something was happening. I've also to add that the police in my country take these issues way too lightly and most of the times just disregard them as women just trying to get some attention or overreacting. And as a result, I could barely sleep. I was always sleeping in the living room so I could be with my dogs and have better access to the front door's window, which was right next to me. I also started checking out the window with my lights out so that he wouldn't see me. I thought that he wasn't there some nights, but I'm pretty sure that I was wrong. As I started to become more suspicious, I also went through the back balcony and into some fields a couple of times and his car was always parked in a really close range of my house, just not across from it anymore. I didn't know how to confront him about this whenever we had classes together. I've told the issues to my newly made friends and sometimes would even pass most of the nights with the marine cop just to feel safe. But they all agreed that if anything happens that I should call them and they would be a witness if the police ever managed to get involved. And then... It came to the night that his alcoholism and unstable mentality kicked in. So I woke up to drink some water and I just saw him staring straight through my window. I honestly just panicked and started yelling, What are you doing here? Get the hell out of my house. I didn't open the door, mind you. But no matter how much I yelled, he kept on staring at me and 
He just seemed totally wasted. I called my neighbor cop and when he saw me on the phone, he started banging on the window. I thought that he was going to break it and my friend came just in time. He put him on the ground and told me that now that we had evidence of trespassing that he could get him to the police. Needless to say though, I left after that. Fast forward one year later, I came back for summer holidays with a family friend of mine. Turned out also to be a stalker later on and it was crazy but that's a story for another time. But of course we went to live in that house. I also have to add here too that my teacher also used to smoke certain brands of cigarettes, ladder, and that he also used a certain type of lighter called a zippo. But the next day of our arrival, me and my friend went to the supermarket to fill the fridge. When we came back, as we took off our shoes off on the couch, she looked at me and said, Hey, did you put these cigarette butts here? We only smoked tobacco, so I went and checked and... On the floor, there were three neatly put cigarette butts. The latter, of course. And after that, I told her about what happened last year. We went into the room to change after this, and we froze in place because someone had gone through all of our stuff. All of my underwear was placed on the bed, and when I went to pick them up, there was something that honestly looked like semen on each and every one of them. In the wardrobe, too, there was a Zippo lighter placed in the middle of one of the shelves. I panicked, obviously, and tried to call my cop friend, but he was transferred elsewhere. We most certainly locked the house before leaving, so we checked the windows and balcony door, all locked. I recalled, though, that my dad was given a spare key to one of the town's hotel owners. I was also friends with the owner's son, who knew all about what happened last year. And I also recalled that upon the first meeting between my dad, the teacher, and me, he mentioned that if I ever get locked out of the house that there was a spare key in the hotel. We went to the hotel and asked if anyone has asked for the house's key and they told us that no one did. We regarded it as one of the windows being either unlocked or that I'd forgotten the door as such. We tried to spend our vacations peacefully and we kept on taking the car with my friends going to random beaches far away each day so that if he were to follow us that taking notice of him would be easy. But we were always surrounded by others too and my friends also told me that the teacher was indeed an alcoholic and really not pleasant to be around. No one informed their parents though because gossip runs faster than the speed of light and the truth is altered greatly in the process. But the last night, my friend and I decided to spend a peaceful night together, just the two of us, watching movies on laptop and cooking. We got drunk and passed out on the couches. The dogs were adopted by my friends when I left, and I woke up in the middle of the night because of a ticklish feeling. I was still wasted and dehydrated from all the drinking, and my head was spinning, and the guy was on top of me and looked like he was jerking off. Upon realizing it, I panicked but didn't move, pretending my body was sliding off the couch so that I could slip away. After a while, I found the opportunity and slipped through him and ran at the door, went out to the street and started yelling out for help until a car passing the road pulled over and a couple in it came out. When we went back to the home, no one was there of course, but thankfully my friend was unharmed, still sleeping and blamed myself for leaving her there and started crying out of relief. Because of my father's prestige and out of fear that he would just criticize me as my mum and stepdad did in the past, I just never went to the police. Fast forward two years though, I've passed the exams after doing an actual prep school and by accident met one of my friends back in the day from that town in the metro. We were catching up with each other when he asked me, so how did the court go with the teacher? I was confused and kind of dumbfounded, asking what court? Apparently, my dad went to his house, though, to chat with him and asked him for a commission for his office. He had two bathrooms, one small and one big. My father was using the small one for some reason, and while the teacher was making coffee, he helped himself with his needs, and he opened the door, and there was nothing left of the bathroom. No sinks, no shower, nothing. And instead, from floor to ceiling, there were only paintings and sketches of me. And a corner of it, there was a small altar set up there. Many of the sketches were apparently of me doing everyday stuff or naked with kind of sensual erotic poses. 
He immediately went on and punched him and then he called the police. My father has a great influence and power in certain areas and he immediately tried to put him in jail. And then he realized that that was probably the reason why I stopped the courses with him. And he's heard about the incident of that night during my vacation since then because the couple were locals of the area and came forth to talk to him. He never did ask me anything though, let alone mention what happened. Because all the cops were his friends, he tried to make sure that he put him in jail, one way or another, quietly. But it was kind of the talk of the town for some time anyway. I felt relief and, if I'm being honest, a bit of shame too that I didn't rely on him due to my past experiences with other family members. And I felt shame too, if I'm being honest, that I never tried to fix the situation because one day he could have harmed someone else if I left it alone. So, I suppose the moral of the story is to rely on others that you can trust. Because, at the end of the day, you could prevent the same things that happened to you, be it a hellish experience or something mundane. I was selfish and a little bit egocentric, only thinking the ifs of reactions and honestly, I think I did more harm than good. Anyway, that's my story and thanks for listening. So, some brief background to begin. I, a 23-year-old male at the time and my brother, 30 years old, we just recently moved into an apartment together, and it was an old two-story house converted to two apartments, upstairs and downstairs, had an attached garage that led onto a downstairs kitchen. Directly next to the door from the kitchen to the garage was the door to our bathroom. So, we had lived there maybe three months at the time of this occurrence. We had left the house around 7pm on a random autumn night, needing groceries, laundry soap, what have you, and... So we buy all of our stuff and make it back to the house. The garage was very narrow, to the point where I had to exit his car before we could pull in so that we could give ourselves more room to get out by getting the passenger side door too close to the wall. So I exit the vehicle, walk into the garage, very poorly lit mind you, one faded light bulb, up the four steps and into the house, groceries in hand. I sit the bags down and immediately head to the bathroom, bladder was about to burst. Maybe one minute has passed from stepping into the house and I hear my brother's car pull in, engine shut off, door open and close, footsteps up the stairs and then silence. Kind of wondering why he hasn't come in the door yet, I finish my business, number one, and I flush. About the time that I start to push the handle to flush, I hear my brother from the garage say, so you're going to open the door or what? I walk back around out of the bathroom, open the door to the garage to see him standing there, mouth wide open, face pale as a ghost. He walks in calmly, sets his few bags of groceries down and proceeds to tell me how he saw me, clearly, fumbling with my keys to try and unlock the door. And as he heard me flush, he blinked and the other me was just gone. He even explained that he could audibly hear the keys jingling and me grunting trying to unlock the door with bags of groceries in my hands. I'm honestly not sure what the heck that was, but I just wanted to share this in case something similar had happened to someone else. So I normally get up and ready for work around 4am and out of the house by 5, 5.30. I had just dropped my daughter off at the babysitter and realized that I forgot to pack my lunch, so I decided to stop at a local Walmart to pick something up. The parking lot was pretty much empty, as was the store because of how early it was. But I went inside, got what I needed, and walked back to my car and got in. On an instinct, I always lock my car doors when I get in. It's just a good habit that I'm in, and I was looking down at my phone, scrolling through, and... All of a sudden, there's this totally normal looking guy just standing at my window. I don't know how, but I didn't even see him approach. He startled me and I immediately put my hand on my hip because I have a pistol there and he motions for me to roll down my window, so stupidly I do, but only slightly enough that I can hear him. He then asks for a ride, says that his car is broke down and his phone is dead and he just lives right around the corner, which... Seemed odd because it's like 69 degrees outside, 
I live in a small town, so it's not a busy road, so, like, walk? I apologised, though, and informed him that I don't give rides to people that I don't know, but I'd be happy to call him a cab to come and pick him up. He got angry with me and asked again and pulled on my door handle. I said, please go, I'm not giving you a ride and you're scaring me. He then looked at me with the nastiest, most disturbing look that I've ever seen on someone's face, and I swear to you that his eyes turned fully black, and then said, well, I guess you get to live today, turned, and just walked away. I sat there, literally shaking and almost in tears. He scared me so bad, so I immediately drove away and called the police. I never did hear back from them, and I really don't know what happened, but it instilled in me my decision to never give strangers rights. When I was 16, I got a job as a personal assistant, a cleaning lady for a wealthy couple who lived in a big beautiful mansion on Lake Michigan. It was a great job at the time, but after a while I had to quit because of everything going on, and I'm going to tell you exactly what that was. So, I made $12 an hour as a 16 year old girl and that was just crazy to me at the time, but now I know that it's because the homeowners couldn't get anyone to stay and work for them. It could very well be because they're both just major dicks, but I honestly didn't see them all that much during the school year, so it was fine. I could work 40 hours a week in the summer and part time while I was in school. So, during the school year, I would hardly ever see the homeowners and would be left alone to clean the house, mostly. I had a key, alarm code, and gate code, so I let myself in and out. In the summer months, I had help from a few other employees, but in the school year, I didn't. At first, I loved being in the house by myself, don't get me wrong. The place was absolutely gorgeous, right on Lake Michigan, so I'd always open all the curtains to let the sunlight in and blast the surround speakers while I cleaned. It wasn't until I was by myself that I just started noticing how weird the place was. Nothing ever exactly felt welcoming about the place. Sure, it was pretty to look at, but it was modern and everything was hard marble and stone. Not very homey feeling. My first experience happened when I was cleaning one day in the silence. I remember specifically not turning on the music because I had a bad headache that day. When all of a sudden, the speaker to the upstairs part of the house turned on. Now, the way their speaker system works, you can control it by like a touchpad thing in the kitchen, which would play the music everywhere besides the basement and master bedroom. To play music in those areas, you have to go to that touchpad and turn it on by the control pad and sync it up with the rest of the house. But the reason this was so alarming was I was the only one there as far as I know. I walked up the stairs to go check out what was going on and figure out why the music was turned on, seemingly by itself. I looked around and called out the homeowner's name thinking that someone just came in without me noticing or something, but the doors were all still locked and no one was home. I shut off the music and went back downstairs, not thinking too much of it because it could have just been a malfunction of some sort, but it started happening more often after this. I'd be listening to music and it would just turn off or it would be off and would turn on in a completely different area of the house or something. I brushed it off as faulty just again and again and didn't think too much of it. But the second and definitely most prevalent story I remember from working there was when I was cleaning the workout room in their basement. I never wanted to go in this room and to be honest I really couldn't tell you why. It was just something about this room that was weird. It was super cold and dark and I just felt really anxious in that room. I definitely tried to avoid it, but my boss would get mad when dust would build up, so I forced myself to go in there once a week to tidy up and whatnot. So, anyway, I was in the workout room using a broom and a mop. I remember sweeping up the floor and propping the broom against a machine while I was using the mop, when suddenly the broom just fell over, hitting the wall, the baseboard, and the floor as it fell, causing three distinct knocks. And what I heard after that scared me so badly that 
I refused to go into that room by myself ever again. Immediately following the knocks made by the broom falling, three knocks responded in the exact same pattern the broom fell. But it was coming from inside of the wall. I know what you're thinking, but no, it was not an echo. It was not a scared animal. It was definitely knocking, deliberate knocking. I was completely alone in a big quiet house in the middle of nowhere and someone is knocking back at me from inside the wall? To this day, I have absolutely no explanation for what I experienced that day. Uh, lastly too, uh, this is the first and only time I've ever seen anything paranormal with my own two eyes and I know this time it's not me being paranoid or crazy because I was with a co-worker who saw it too. So sometimes my boss would rent out her guest room and we would clean it before the guests arrived. And this guest house has a glass hallway leading from one main area of the house to another. So I was cleaning the glass while one of my co-workers, Bob, was standing next to me talking. And just then I catch a glimpse of what looked like a boy in a blue shirt running by. I turned my head just as Bob turned his head as well and he asked me if I saw that too. And I said yes. Like I said, I eventually did quit this job because there were just too many weird things happening in that place for me to be there and feel safe. So, a year ago, my apartment complex decided that they wanted to renovate my unit, so I had to move out at the end of my lease. I live in Denver and rent is pretty ridiculous here so I started worrying about finding something affordable in my neighborhood, which I love. I posted on the next door app to see if anyone in my neighborhood knew of any affordable rentals in the area and I immediately got a message from someone named Joe who said that one of the condos in his complex was going to be up for rent soon and he knew the owner. He offered to get me in touch with the owner and I asked if he could send me pictures of the unit and he asked if he could text me some pictures his neighborhood took because that chat function on the app is really slow. I now feel stupid for doing this but I gave him my phone number and I kid you not, I received a phone call from an unknown number within seconds. I normally don't answer calls from unknown numbers, but I was expecting a call from a number that wasn't saved in my phone anyway, so I answered it. But I was completely bewildered when the person said, Hi, it's Joe. How's your day going? It honestly took me by surprise, and I just didn't know what to say. He started to shoot the breeze on the phone with me, talking about how he works nights and how tired he is and how he takes care of his daughter while his girlfriend works during the day and I finally interrupted and said, so about that condo and he just pretty much disregarded that and said, I don't think my girlfriend would appreciate me talking to you but I don't have to tell her, right? At this point I said that I have to go and I just immediately hung up the phone. As soon as I did, he started texting me though. It was just really bizarre and kind of alarming to me, I must admit. And I just blocked his number, but moments later, he found me on Facebook and sent me a friend request. Now, I'm 32 years old, but it was so disturbing to me that I called my parents to tell them about it and how unnerved it made me. And the worst part is that on next door, even if your exact address isn't listed, your complex is. I was pretty certain that I didn't have my address visible on my profile, but I checked and sure enough, my address and unit number were public. Unable to contact me any other way, he started messaging me again on next door, asking if I wanted to go on a walk with him. You can't block or report people on this app, so I eventually just deleted it. But one night, a month or so later, I had a knock at my door around 10 on a weeknight. I looked out my peephole, but couldn't get a good enough look at the person. He had his head down slightly, but either way, I don't answer the door for anyone that I'm not expecting, especially not a random guy at 10 o'clock at night. But feeling panicked though, I call my neighbor across the hall. She's an older woman, and we look out for each other since we both live alone. I asked her if it looked like he was a delivery guy at the wrong door or something. She opened her door to get a good look at the guy and that spooked him because he 
he just literally ran away. Now, I have no idea if this was the next door guy or not, but my gut tells me that it probably was. This was a big wake-up call, though. I always felt like I practiced good online safety, but I didn't even know my address was visible on next door. I'll never be casual or lazy about privacy settings like that again, that's for sure. But for now, I have to deal with the fact that this creepy guy knows where I live and allegedly is showing up to my house late at night. So I told a story a few weeks back about uh, some whistling in the woods by the back of my house that really spooked one of my dogs and I don't know if you guys remember it but it's been a, kind of an ongoing situation for a while now. So that kind of thing kept going on for about a week I'd say, maybe two at most and then really everything just kind of stopped. And nothing strange or suspicious has happened at all for the past month in fact. It's been really calm, the dogs have been great, other than my largest dog being diagnosed with cancer, which is a bit of a shame, but otherwise really quiet. I'm pretty sure I kept hearing whistling for about two weeks, but it died down pretty fast, and whatever was going on really seems to have stopped. Or well, I, I thought it had at least. Last night though, I fell asleep on the couch after watching the basketball game, Warriors vs the Blazers. And I woke up abruptly to a knock on my bedroom door. It's an exterior door because I filled in my carport as a master suite about 10 years back. So the knock came from that door and I woke up pretty scared but still pretty unalert. I get to the door after a few seconds and decide that I have to open it and see what, if anything, is knocking. And when I open it, there's nothing there. Which, to be honest, is pretty typical lately. But anyway, I have no idea what it was. It could have literally been anything. So I'm kind of just too tired to think and I just went back to bed and went to sleep. That's cool, right? Nothing weird. But when I woke up this morning, I opened that door, remembering being woken up overnight. And still nothing. Well, not at first. But then I looked down and then I see just blood everywhere. At first, I'm like, what the heck is that? But I get a closer look and I confirm that it's definitely blood. And I just say to myself, what the hell is going on? There was definitely no whistling, but what is all this blood from? Why is it at my door? And I can also see what looks like paw prints. But my dogs were all inside the house by 11.30 and didn't go back outside until around 7.45 in the morning. Guys, I'm actually starting to get a bit scared now, seriously, because whoever or whatever is responsible for this obviously hasn't gone yet and I'm still dealing with this situation. Plus, it seems to be escalating now. So in the 80s, my aunt, M had actually won $14 million in the lottery. But with her winnings too, she made her own house from scratch on this big plot of land. It's still there today in fact, but owned and renovated by its new owners. But my uncle that bought her the ticket had unfortunately died in the year 2000 from an abrupt heart attack, so needless to say, she moved out of her dream home because it was just too much for her to bear. She still owned the house for quite a while. She didn't live in it, but she had made up a new house from scratch to live in with her new husband. Her previous house was vacant for years and years, and in 2013 or 14, I think, she couldn't afford to pay the lot rent for both places. My younger cousin, my older cousin and I, as well as our dads and uncles and older cousins' close family friend, went there before she sold it to get family mementos and reminisce about the good times. From the beginning, this was hard to do because after years of abandonment, it had no lights or water and was overgrowing on the inside. And at around four in the morning one day, after hearing the weirdest noises ever, which I now think was just an old house dying. I mean, the house was huge and had a basement and then another basement underneath that and was built in the 80s. 
but we decided to go out back and decompress and say our goodbyes around a fire before going home. So there are four levels to the house, two above ground and two below ground, and on every level there was some way to get out of the house directly to the yard. We were all walking up these long bomb shelter like stairs from the bottom basement to the yard and my older cousin's friend that came with, B, had to go back down for something that he left. The stairs came out of a hill so it was such a long hike up that we were all like, we just walked all the way up here and we're just going to go back down. About 10 minutes passed after coming out and we had the fire all set up though and were sitting around it when all the adults noticed B hadn't come back yet. But they joke saying that he got stuck or lost or something, but eventually the jokes just weren't really funny anymore. My dad and Uncle L went down to look for him and came back up to say that they just couldn't find him anywhere. It was at this point that my younger cousin and I started freaking out because we were scared and pretty young, like 14 or 15, and the other adults started tripping out and worrying because all the doors got locked before we left. We all left the sub-basement door, which was the only one left to lock. My dad and Elle went down again to check if all the doors were still locked, and they were. Also, some backstory on B2 is that he's too large and physically incapable of getting through a window. In fact, he could barely lift his leg up past his knee. We all decided to sit there, though, just waiting for B to come out of this door that's about 10 yards away from us. When, all of a sudden, he calls my older cousin, saying... I don't know what to tell you, but I just woke up at my house. B lived over 40 miles away at this time, and my older cousin just started uncontrollably sobbing. My younger cousin's dad, Zed, said, it's time to go now, and starts to get up to throw water on the fire, when, out of the deafening silence, this sound that was unbearably loud just shook all of us. It honestly sounded like a giant generator just getting shut off. Me and my younger cousin, my dad and my older cousin immediately started screaming. Did you guys hear that? But my uncle, Zed and Elle were totally stuck like something out of a late night episode of the Twilight Zone. Zed was in a position of getting up but was just kind of stuck there, frozen where he was. Elle was laughing at everybody but then all of a sudden just wasn't anymore. He was just there, open mouth, crinkled eyes, smiling like he did while laughing. My dad and older cousin started shaking them and my dad was freaking out and must have thought that they died or something because he just kept saying, please, no, L, please don't do this. But my younger cousin and I were absolutely terrified, obviously, in every meaning of the word. My dad and older cousin took us back up to the car and locked it, despite us crying our eyes out because we didn't want to be left alone and then they went back. I don't know how long passed, but soon enough, lights came up from the hills and it was all of them walking towards us. My dad decided my younger cousin was going to stay with us for the night, and L and Zed just went home without looking in our direction or saying anything to us. We kept asking my dad and older cousin what exactly was even happening and what was going on, and my dad just kept saying, for as long as we live, we will never talk to you guys or anyone about this night ever. Four different times in this long rant about not knowing what life was anymore, my older cousin turned and looked at us dead in the eyes and said, there are some things that you just want to accept as never being able to know the real answers to. And after that, we just rode home in silence. My younger cousin and I talked about it at least once a month since it happened, but never dared to talk to them about it because of the one time we tried and they had gotten belligerently mad because we kept pressing about it. My younger cousin and I have had a conversation about it, summing up that we fabricated the whole story or something, knowing well enough that we must have been lying to each other, especially considering that we still talk about it to this day and that exact conversation was years ago. Honestly, the whole situation is just really weird and I know that this is a strange one but if anyone has any direction to point me to for possible explanations or information or even clues I would greatly appreciate it. So this happened a long long time ago probably when I was about eight I'd say. 
For context, at this point in time, I shared a bedroom with my two brothers. One of my brothers and I shared a bunk bed and I was on the top bunk. To prevent me from falling off, there was a metal bar around the top bunk, which is important to the story later. So one night, for a reason that I couldn't understand, my mother woke me up and asked me to come talk to her and my dad in their room. She wouldn't tell me why, but I did what she said and went into my parents' bedroom. And this is when things got really weird. From here on out, I don't remember certain things about the conversation. I don't remember actually going into my parents' bedroom. I don't remember any specific details and... I don't remember how long the conversation lasted for even. I know I said that this happened a long time ago, but even the day after this happened, I couldn't remember the conversation really well. It was as if I was just fading in and out of consciousness or something, losing track of my memory. The only two things that I can definitely remember is talking about Lego Star Wars. No clue why. I didn't have that game at the time. And my parents asking me who was my dad despite my dad sitting right next to me. Then, somehow, I ended up in my bed again, asleep. And to be honest with you, I don't even remember going back into my room to go to sleep again. Anyway, the next day rolls around and my parents briefly talk about it, but I'm kind of unsure about what happened, almost doubting it. It wasn't until a few years later my parents told me what was actually going on when I asked about the incident. So on that night, my parents woke to a loud banging noise coming from my room. Scared that someone was inside, my mum investigated. And as it turns out, I was making the noise by bashing my head against my pillow repeatedly with no signs of stopping. Scared and confused, my mum went over to me and quietly said my name and asked if I was alright. I stopped bashing my head at this point and turned to face her. My eyes were wide open and expressionless, according to her. And then, all of a sudden, I slammed my head into the metal bar surrounding my top bunk really hard. Luckily, my mum had put a hand on it, which sort of cushioned it for me, but hurt my mum in the process. I then look at her and just say unintelligible words, then close my eyes and go back to sleep. However, I doubt that I ever woke up, as I honestly cannot remember any of this for the life of me. My mum leaves, explains this to my dad, and this is when they decide to wake me up and take me into their room to ask if I'm okay. This is where things get even weirder too, because the little I can remember apparently just didn't happen at all. I was apparently talking absolute nonsense to them. Nothing I said made any sense to them. She couldn't even recall what I was talking about because of how little sense it made. But... All of a sudden, I stop and just became terrified. My mum asks what's wrong, and I say in the most horrified tone, Mum, where's Dad? She explained that Dad was right next to me, and he was fine, and I look at him and just say, I know. Turn back around, get scared again, and say, Mum, where's Dad? And this went on for an hour, apparently, before they decided to just let me go back to sleep. Strangely enough, too, nothing like that ever happened again. Maybe I had some sort of a mental breakdown. Maybe something else. I really don't know, but it was weird and creepy, and I honestly still get nervous thinking about it. This story took place in summer of 2017. I had joined the Canadian Army Reserve Infantry. Most infantry reserves from my part of Canada do their DP-1, infantry course, on a base known as 4C DTC, or Mayford. It's been there just a really long time, and in the large training area there are many old ruins from what seems like pioneer times or something. But these mostly consist of old stone buildings that have been neglected for what seems like a century. Now, I've never been a superstitious person in the slightest, and I've never really believed in anything paranormal, but during my infantry course, I had an encounter that still just gives me the chills two years later. 
So my section, about eight guys and an instructor, we were doing nighttime navigation. The instructor would give us points on a map and we would have to make our way to it, but we had to stay off roads to keep concealed and whatnot. And if you'd never done it before, walking around in the woods at night is already creepy enough, but near the end of the night, probably around 3am I'd say, we were given a point in a map that just said ruins. Okay, whatever, let's just get this over with. In the training area it is 90% just forest and a few dirt roads and a couple of gun ranges, but mostly nature has taken over at this point. We get about 50 meters from the ruins and... We notice the grass here has been mugged, which is weird considering that all the other ruins have just been left to rot. It was a pretty warm night too, it was in the middle of July I'd say, and we'd been walking for hours at this point, but the temperature just all of a sudden seemed to drop. I figured it was just me being paranoid, so I kept it to myself. But it wasn't just me. We all felt like we were freezing out of nowhere. Even the instructor said something. And something just didn't seem right the closer we got to this thing. The ruins on the map were a singular well-kept cemented grave with a small new looking chain link fence around it. Everyone is noticeably uncomfortable. We try to call in that we found the point on our radio, but there's no signal. We had been standing there for maybe two minutes at this point when we hear loud rustling and loud creaking. And then... My fire team partner almost flew forward as if someone pushed him, but when we all looked, no one was there. He got all pissy because he thought that we were messing with him, but we were just as freaked as him. And at this point, we just got out of there ASAP, and I haven't gone back to that area since. At the time, we didn't know this, but the base rumor said that the grave belonged to a girl who was hung for, apparently, being a witch. She is commonly known as Blue Eyes, and a lot of people have similar stories to ours. Mostly, they sound fake, but once in a while, I'll hear about temperature dropping and odd creaking, and I'll think back to that night. So this is a short one, but it's something that I've just never forgotten. So when I was seven, I was playing with a ball in the living room. Then I just felt the urge to look at the door, which was made of glass and wood with little windows. I looked and there was nothing there. After that I just continued playing, but then the feeling hit me again. Look at the door, my brain was telling me, so I looked again. And there it was. On one of the little windows, an old lady that seemed like she was at least a hundred years old who looked completely like a creepy old witch, was just staring directly at me, laughing without sound and finally pointing her finger at me. Panicking, I ran to the only point of the room where you couldn't see the door and stayed there looking at the ground, because in the same room there was a mirror that reflected to the door. A couple of minutes passed, time to go to bed. At this time my mother was with me. I looked again to see if the old lady was still there and nothing. That night... I went to sleep with the blankets over my head. So, I've been hearing some weird stories from my daughter lately that have been reminding me of an experience that I had when I was younger. And I wanted to get your guys' take on it. A bit of backstory first, though. So... In 1994, when I was 11, I had an encounter with something that I can only describe as a shadow person. At the time, I had no idea what it was. A ghost, an alien, I had no clue. It started one April night when I was asleep, dreaming, and in my dream I was sitting on a wall looking over the PE field of my school when a kid that bullied me in real life came up to me, punched me in the chest, knocking me off the wall. I felt the pull, physical force of the blow, and it woke me up. I woke up screaming at him, my chest hurting from the punch, my physical body had been hit, and I had the wind just knocked out of me. When I woke up, I bolted upright to my sitting position, clutching my chest trying to breathe. And as soon as I looked up across the room, I saw this thing. It looked like a shadowy kind of hooded monk, I suppose. 
But where its face should have been was just a darker shade of black. It seemed to be folding something in its hands over and over again. I say folding, but it was like he was manipulating a liquid cloth. The fabric flowed back and forth in its hands and it was also black. A bright light shone from behind the creature. I remember being able to see my posters on the wall behind where it stood. But there was no other light in the room other than what was emanating from him. As soon as I saw it, I was just paralyzed. I was trapped in my body and I couldn't move and now my chest hurt even more since I couldn't breathe. I don't know how much time passed with me in this state, but after a while I could feel my body begin to come back to me. At first, my toes began twitching, then my fingers and eyelids, and then a rush of sensation came back to me. I was finally able to breathe and move around again, but the creature was still there. I had no idea what to do. If I was to run out of the room, I would have to push past the thing as he was very near the entrance to my room, and I did not want that thing touching me again. I tried talking to it, asking who he was and what did he want, why did he hit me. I told him to leave but he just wouldn't respond. He just kept looking down at what he was folding in his hands and would look back up at me every so often like he was making sure I was staying put. Something told me though that somehow this thing had known what I was dreaming and that he had used the dream to attack me and wake me up, or something like that at least. The longer he stayed there, the more afraid I became though. I tried pinching myself, closing and opening my eyes and it was still there. I lived in Los Angeles, and this was a few months after the Northbridge earthquake. After having lived through that, I had this fear of being trapped in my room from a quake, so for a long while I would just store supplies near my bed, bottles of water, saltine crackers, and a flashlight. I kept the flashlight under my pillow, in fact. It's hard to describe, but it was like I heard this voice in my head trying to help me through this encounter. It reminded me about the flashlight, but told me not to let this thing see me get it. I had no idea what I was going to do with a flashlight against this thing, but it was all I had, so I pretended that I thought I was dreaming, and that I was going back to bed. As I laid down, I could see the posture of the shadow creature change. It seemed to become antsy, paying more attention to me, but it would just not stop folding the liquid cloth. I grabbed the flashlight and cracked open my eyes to make sure it was still there. It was and as I sat up and turned the flashlight on to shine at it, the voice told me to shine it where its heart would be, if it had a heart. As soon as the light hit it, the creature just kind of imploded into nothingness. I could see a spiral of darkness and light for a few seconds, and then it was just gone. And the next morning, I had a bruise on my chest where I'd been hit. I never saw the shadow creature again, I've had a couple of experiences in my life that I wondered if it was tied to, but could never be sure. Fast forward to now though, 25 years later, I'm married with two beautiful children. My first child, my son, seems to have a bit of a, a psychic twinkle, I suppose. He's predicted a few things before they happened and has shared a couple of dreams with me. He's been showing me signs of this stuff since he was first learning to speak, but his little sister never really seemed to have the same sixth sense as him. That is, until now. A few months ago, my five-year-old daughter began to tell me about dreams that she was having, about a shadow man. In her first dream, she dreamt that she had woken up to use the bathroom. When she finished using the toilet, she opened the door to the bathroom to leave and saw him on the other side of the door. The shadow man apparently chased her, trying to grab her and ended up biting her on her finger. She's had a number of dreams about the shadow man chasing her over the past few months. She says that he has somehow turned her good dreams into bad dreams and is afraid of him. I've never told her or my son about my encounter with a shadow person. With the story that she's told me about her shadow man though, she's always been clear that she's only seen him while she's sleeping and dreaming. Until today. She was at her preschool today, having a snack. She was standing by a table where her snack and milk was and she looked up at the entrance to a classroom and she saw the shadow man from her dreams outside the doorway to the classroom. It scared her so badly that she knocked over a milk box. She tried to point it out to her classmates but no one else saw him. She says though that the shadow man ran away when he saw that she could see him. To be completely honest with you guys, I, I just don't know what to do.
and my husband, even though he's a believer in the paranormal possibilities, thinks that she just has an overactive imagination. He's not saying that she's lying, but thinks that she didn't really see what she thinks she saw. The way that she speaks to me about this shadow man and the details that she tells me about the dreams just gives me chills. It reminds me so much of what I encountered as a kid and I don't want my daughter to be scared of this thing and I don't want her to have dreams about this thing anymore but I don't think telling her something like it's not real is just going to help. I also don't think that telling her that I think it's real is going to help either though. I remember my parents not believing me after my experience and to be quite frank it hurt. But they would tell me not to be silly or dramatic even though I knew what had happened to me was real and I was terrified of it. At least I was older when I had my experience but my daughter is only five. I also don't know for sure if this is anything paranormal at all or if it's psychological or what. It very well could be that she's just having reoccurring nightmares inspired by something scary that she saw on TV. Whatever this is though, I don't think she's being silly or dramatic and I don't think she's lying. It's definitely real to her. And if this is paranormal, what the hell is it then? Is it the same thing that attacked me? Is it now going after my kid? But why? Or is it a completely different thing altogether? If you're still listening, then thank you. And if you have any ideas or similar experiences, I'm open to hearing them. It was 2002. I was living with my boyfriend in a small home, just the two of us. The layout of the bedroom is important to the story too, so I'll describe it. So we had a small bedroom with a queen bed. The bed was pushed into a corner with the right side up against a wall and the left side with a small nightstand and just a small amount of room to walk beside the bed. And when you walked into the room, the foot of the bed was immediately to your right, closet door to the left. So, one night, my boyfriend and I are asleep. I slept on the left near the walkway because I tend to get up to pee a lot. When I wake up suddenly in the middle of the night. The room is dark, but my eyes are adjusted and I can pretty much see everything. I didn't know why I woke up, but right when I did, my dog Daisy came walking into the bedroom, walking right up to me and started happily sniffing my face like she was glad that I was awake. And walking right behind my dog was my boyfriend. But something was just off about him. He walked with tiny little steps, almost comical in nature. And his head was down, making his long hair cover his face. But I could tell it was him. Same clothes, same hair, same body, shape, everything. He baby stepped all the way around the bed and right up behind my dog though. And when he made it up behind her, she looked back at him and then just walked away, leaving the bedroom entirely. I watched both of them the whole time this took place and I wasn't scared or confused, I was just kind of watching. Then, my boyfriend baby stepped closer to me and then leaned in over me, his hair still covering his face. He was leaned so far over me in fact that I thought he was looking for something. That's when I got confused and I was just about to ask, what the hell are you doing? When I glanced over to his side of the bed and to my horror, it was my sleeping boyfriend. I cannot explain the overwhelming surge of fear and panic that I felt in that moment. I was frozen with fear. I couldn't make a single sound in fact. And when I turned towards the person I thought was my boyfriend, it quickly and swiftly leaned up straight and stepped backwards into my curtains and just completely disappeared. And that's when I was finally able to scream, and I screamed my lungs out. I had no answers and no clue on earth what I had just seen. My super Christian friend told me that it was a demon, that it took the form of my boyfriend. She explained her reasons, but I've since forgotten what she had told me, and for years after that, nothing like that ever happened to me again. That is... Until 2018. So it was summer break 2018. My boyfriend and I had a son in 2005 but we broke up shortly after unfortunately. He is a good dad and we split amicably. 
The now ex-boyfriend stops by fairly often, and if I don't hear him at the door, he'll come on in. So one night, my elderly pug woke me up barking. He sleeps right in my armpit, basically, so I immediately noticed what he was barking at. It was my ex-boyfriend, and he was leaning into my bedroom door, and he was just smiling at me, but with the pug steadily barking at him. As soon as I looked at him, I was immediately just annoyed. He woke me up, so in my sleepy annoyance, I say, what do you want? And he's still leaning in my door still smiling at me. What, I yell, really pissed by this point. And then he just shuts the door. That actually really angered me even further because I felt like he'd awakened me for something, but he wasn't talking or answering my questions. So I started shouting, I'm up, I'm up, what is it? And I fling the covers off of me, and in a matter of seconds, I open up my bedroom door expecting him to be standing there, but... There's just nothing. It's just my dark hallway. Not quite grasping what was going on, I walk around my house trying to find him. And he's just not there at all. Now, it had been so long since it first happened that I was more shocked than scared. I don't scare too easily these days, I suppose, so I text him right away and... He still remembers the first time this happened to me, even though he dismissed it the first occurrence as a really vivid dream, despite me being adamant that I was fully awake when it happened. So I was surprised by his reaction to this second occurrence. He actually believed me. What really sold him was my pug, Mr. Muggs. He barked a lot at whatever was leaning into my bedroom door. But something else I didn't realize until I was texting my ex is the fact that Mr. Muggs never barks at him. He honestly loves my ex. So in the end, I just kind of chalk it all up to another sighting of an entity that looks exactly like my ex and 15 years after the first time, which was really, really odd to say the least, but what can I do? A month or so goes by. I believe if you put too much thought and emotion into the paranormal, it can feed on that, so I just brushed it off. I just didn't give it a second thought beyond the first day after it happened. It was weird, I must admit, but I just tried to forget it happened. That kind of thing. So, August of 2018, my niece found a little puppy in a ditch on the side of the road. I immediately fell in love and opted to adopt her. Her name is Peekaboo, if you must know, and my son and I fell head over heels in love with her. Every night she would whine to get into my bed with me and Mr. Muggs, and every night I happily obliged. But one night I woke up to my son standing at the side of my bed. Mum, mum, he said, can I sleep with you in your bed and puppy? I was not happy that he woke me. I said, you can see the puppy tomorrow, son. But he begged me, please. I want to sleep in the bed with you and the puppy. I was not having it though, so I told him, no, I barely have room as it is, go to bed. He hung his head down, but he didn't say anything else, and I watched as he left. I was already feeling guilty too, and just as he shut the door, I had a change of heart. I called out, come back, I'm sorry, as I threw back the covers and quickly opened my door. And... My stomach sank when I opened the door and saw nothing. The hallway was empty, dark, and quiet once again. No lights, no sounds, and it had only been a few seconds from the time my son shut my door to the point where I was opening it back up. I definitely would have seen him, so I quickly walked to my son's room, opened his door, and there he was, sound asleep in his bed. Now, I didn't want to freak him out, so the next day I simply asked him, so did you come into my room last night? And he responded with a yes, in fact. I was relieved until he added, when I came to tell you goodnight, remember? And that was hours before I had seen him in my room that night, wanting in my bed. I never told him what happened that night, and it hasn't happened again. I hope it never does, because... It does actually scare me a lot. I mean, it spoke. It wanted in my bed. I talked to it. What if I had said yes too? I shudder at that thought. 
I don't know what to make of this and why I see these things that just looked like my loved ones. I have heard other doppelganger stories, but my experience is a little different from others that I've heard. Are they ghosts or demons? I have no idea, but I'm certainly curious to hear your thoughts. I was at home alone in my previous apartment in a not so great neighborhood. My apartment was on the ground level and my bedroom window faced a back alley. A dumpster sat less than two car lengths away where homeless people often rummaged and just before dawn one morning I heard a tapping at my window. My back was to the window and my eyes were now wide open. It was still dark outside, but I slept with my lamp on and my worn out vertical blinds were missing a slat, causing a six inch gap. So I knew that whoever or whatever the source of the tapping could see me lying in bed as plain as day. The tapping was brief, maybe five or six taps, so I spent the next five seconds or so pretty much frozen, bizarrely trying to convince myself that it was something or anything else but a person watching me and tapping on my window, maybe an animal or something. But then came more tapping, and now I was faced with the terrifying reality that someone had been watching me through my window in the dark for god knows how long, and they decided to tap on the window. Had one of the homeless people become more aggressive during their dumpster dive? But something told me that nothing good could come from turning around and looking at the window. If he got me to look at him, what then? Remember too that my back was to the guy so I sat up slowly rubbing my eyes and pretending that I was too groggy to hear him. I stood up and easily made my way out of the bedroom as though I were going to the restroom or something. Once I was out of sight I ran to the phone to dial 911 though considering whether to forget any embarrassment of being in my t-shirt and underwear and bolt out my front door which was out of sight from the intruder. I just wasn't sure though if I could outrun whoever it was or whether anyone would help me if I couldn't. Before I could make a decision though I heard the loud pop of my window being pried open. I thought my heart would jump out of my chest and at the same time I could hear my upstairs neighbour Mike descending his stairs. I opened my door a few inches and peeked out to ask for his help and Mike was a big guy and I'd heard that he was trained in martial arts of some sort and he didn't hesitate to respond, hustling to the back of my apartment to see what was going on. But within a few seconds, I heard rumbling and someone being thrown against the wall and into the bushes. A few moments later, Mike came around to my front door, telling me not to worry about seeing that guy again. He'd apparently beaten him up pretty badly. I wanted to believe Mike, that the would-be intruder was maybe dumpster diving, but that he would hopefully never venture this way again. But strangely, it's wasn't actually a homeless person. According to Mike, when the guy escaped, he ran to the front of my building, hopped into a red sports car and sped off. My neighborhood wasn't a red sports car kind of place. The police later told me that the intruder was likely someone who'd seen me out somewhere and followed me home to find out where I lived. I still wonder what would have happened if Mike hadn't have got inside before that guy did. I also wonder now if the guy is still following me, and because of that, I often find myself wishing that Mike maybe put an end to him. Several years ago, I decided to make the stupid decision of moving in with my now ex-boyfriend, Bob. It just seemed logical at the time instead of paying two rent payments. We were actively looking for months and he stumbled upon a house for rent in a fairly nice and convenient area of town. The owner had another person interested in the house but he told Bob that if he came that day to look at the house and sign the lease that it would be ours. I was at work but I trusted him. I was young and very naive. So stupid. And I just let him do it. Later that day I met Bob at the house and do a walk through together for the first time. I pulled up in front of the house and as soon as I saw it I just couldn't get out of the car. He was already there waiting for me on the porch but I instantly started tearing up because I just knew somehow that something was terribly wrong with this house. But at this point it was just too late. We had committed to it for an entire year. 
The house was an older house, but just remodeled to look new. It had an odd setup too, with a main bedroom in the front that attached to the living room and the kitchen. There were two extra smaller bedrooms in the back of the house attached to the laundry room. There was one bathroom that was attached to both the main bedroom and living room, and it had two doors. I have a very long history with hauntings and I'm still convinced that I have attachments with me at my current residence, so it wasn't surprising when unusual things began to happen. Door slamming, lights flickering, footsteps, voices. However, I quickly found out that this thing did not want us there. Bob worked evenings, so I was usually home a majority of the time by myself. It only took a week before I saw his full apparition in the laundry room. I was cooking dinner and heard the dogs growling toward the back door. I looked over and a man was just standing there looking at me. He was really tall with dark hair. He was always wearing a red flannel shirt and had a really angry or blank expression on his face. We locked eyes and he just walked into the spare bedroom and disappeared. The longer we lived in that house too, the more violent things became. The whole house would shake sometimes and we couldn't keep anything on the walls. We were watching TV one night and a picture on the wall just shattered like it had been punched. Another time we were cooking dinner and we both saw a glass lift off the counter and slam against the wall, barely missing Bob's face. I think one of the scariest moments for me personally was when I was taking a bath one night. I was just relaxing and had the curtain closed when I saw a dark shadow on the other side of the curtain. Thinking that it was Bob, I started talking to him, but my heart dropped when I heard the TV on in the living room and heard Bob on the phone. I don't think one can describe the feeling that I had run through me at that time when I realized that my ex was not the person standing on the other side of the shower curtain. It took every ounce of courage that I had to jump up and pull back the curtain. I started screaming for Bob and at the same time, one of the bedroom doors slammed shut, the other was already closed, and I could hear Bob trying everything that he could to get to me. I was screaming and he was screaming and the dogs were barking and growling and it was just absolutely terrifying. The doors weren't locked but neither of us could get them to open and after about a 15 minute struggle, both doors just opened and everything went quiet. After that incident too, I begged Bob to move. He was working almost every night and at this point I couldn't stand to be alone in that house anymore. I felt like a prisoner and began to isolate myself to the main bedroom because that seemed where the least amount of activity was. But one night I woke up in the middle of the night and saw the man standing in the doorway to the bedroom but he never came into the room. My relationship with Bob began to deteriorate because he didn't understand how much the entity was affecting me. I wasn't eating, I wasn't sleeping, and my physical and mental health were just dropping. But people laugh at me when I blame it on something supernatural, but it was unhealthy for me to stay in that house. I had to leave, and eventually I did. Like my other stories too, I constantly ask myself, why me? I'd never faced off with something like this. I had encountered plenty of negative things before, but this, this was different. This felt like a physical attack. Bob was just lucky enough to also witness it at the time. Otherwise, I'm sure that he would have thought that I was completely mad. I guess my question to you guys, though, is do people attract spirits or something? Or is it just a coincidence that I moved into another haunted house? And if it is coincidence, why do I still feel like I'm never alone? My grandmother met my grandfather when they were in high school, became high school sweethearts, wrote letters to each other when my grandfather was deployed in World War II and eventually they married. In the 1950s, they moved into a tiny two-bedroom, 900-foot square house in Oklahoma that was built in the 1930s. I don't know if it was due to their values or if later in life there was a strain in their relationship, but they each slept in different bedrooms. I never met my grandfather. He passed away before I was born. My grandmother never remarried, just continued to live in this house until she passed away in 2009. She always left my grandfather's room the way it was when he was alive, and before she passed away, she sold her house to my brother who had just recently married his wife. 
When my brother moved in, he began to remodel the house, and that was when we began to experience a few weird things. So my brother was an entrepreneur and started a private security business. He ended up converting my grandfather's bedroom into an office. My brother began telling his wife that when he would walk out of the office and into the hallway, he would hear a growling sound just over his shoulder. She thought that my brother was just trying to scare her, but then she began to hear the growling sound too. One day, while sitting at his office desk, he felt like someone was leaning on his office chair, leaning it back, when all of a sudden the whole chair moved forward while he was still leaning back, causing him to hit his elbow on his desk and bruise it pretty badly. Another day, he and his wife were sitting in the front room watching TV when he heard two of his three cats just start growling. As they were looking towards the office with their hair standing on end. They heard a crashing noise and the third cat came sprinting out of the office and into the front room where it stopped and looked back into the office. Then the computer mouse came flying out of the room just missing the cat. The worst thing that happened though was one very late night in August, about 2am, my brother gets a call from one of his employees. He takes the call to his office to conduct business and while trying to talk to the employee, the employee states, I'm sorry, I don't know if that's your wife talking, but I'm having a hard time hearing you. My brother informs him that his wife is asleep and it's just him in the office. Right after he says this, my brother hears my mum's voice coming from the front door saying, Hello, hello, and my brother tells his employee, I have to call you back. My mum is here. She lives an hour away and it's not like her to be here. He eventually gets to the front door and opens it and no one is there. My brother goes outside, no car, no one around. He says though that it's unusually cold. He can see his breath condensate. He turns and looks into the front room through the window and he sees a woman dressed in all white walk from the office through his front room into his kitchen and out into his garage. He says that he immediately has an overwhelming sense of sadness come over him and he begins to cry uncontrollably. He rushes inside to wake up his wife who tells him to leave her alone but after a few attempts she wakes up and asks what's wrong? Before he can explain, there are multiple loud crashes coming from the garage and my brother tells her that they need to leave right now. They go and drive around for an hour or so talking about what happened after this. They also call me and tell me what happened. At first I think it's a prank, but my brother is always serious, never religious and doesn't believe in anything supernatural. They head back home to find the garage in just shambles. After these events, years go by with no other incidents. My brother had a daughter and he converted the office into a bedroom for her. He walks by her room one day and when she's laying down for a nap, he hears what sounds like a man talking in a room, a popping sound and then her crying. After going into the room, the electrical outlet next to her crib is sparking and just singed. She's four years old now and nothing else has happened since that incident, but... I have house watched for him quite a few times and I haven't personally experienced anything that I would say is paranormal. Closest thing I can say is I woke up with a feeling like something heavy was on my legs, like a cat, but none of them were around. Oh, and uh, I remember seeing a dark shadow too that looked like a person moving away from the foot of the bed once I woke up, but it could have just been my eyes adjusting, I suppose. So, uh, a little pretext. I was up late to 1.30am binging Game of Thrones, laid down around 2am and was asleep for about an hour until this happened. Before I woke up, I caught the end of a dream where a group of people were in a Toyota SUV. Two were in the back, a woman in the front passenger seat, noticeably distressed. The guys come rushing to the driver's seat and start it up and she jumps in terror clutching a silver object. My brain for some reason tells me that it's iron, but while she looks on in terror, all I see is nothing and a round stone base. Also, I do remember something standing, blurred or out of focus, but then cue me waking up. Now, I've seen this, uh, this thing flowing from my hallway ceiling a handful of times before, but not like this. So, 
But to get on with it though, it's kind of like a shadowy, almost solid flowing kind of mass coming from my hallway, which had me spooked, but I've seen this type of thing before, so it was kind of no big. It was kind of a, I don't mess with you and you keep going on and being creepy all the way over there, as I keep a close eye on it, but, but then I look on and I keep studying it, and it forms multiple sets of these kind of multicolored eyes, at 10 to 15 sets in random places. Then I notice mouths appearing, and then I could see the jagged teeth, and then the faces start to form. At this point, I turn on my phone flashlight in a discreet scramble, and nothing. As soon as there's any light, it usually vanishes, but it was moving closer this time, and the mass grew in size as it became more defined. I threw the sheets over my head and just sat there breathing heavily for a few minutes, and then I slowly peeked out again, and it was gone. To be honest with you guys, I think after typing this, I feel like it might be coming from the attic that I've been warned to actually not go into. It's a rented house, and it's supposedly super gross and dirty up there, but I don't know, I, I think something fishy's going on here. Also, I would like to add that this black mass that appears is located a yard from where my six-year-old brother sleeps. I hadn't thought about that fact, actually, until I started sharing this with you guys. I do hope that someone out there believes me because I'm not one to lie. It's never given any real benefits in my life, in fact. I like to think of myself as a pretty logical person, and I know that most crazy happenings can be explained away with science and logic, but today was just way too much. I've always felt various things around me, the goosebump kind of feeling, and have noticed bright glowing eyes at night. I've seen animals at night, and... I can assure you that it's not them, and that I'm not mistaking this. Also, before I forget to mention this, during all of this there was a tall dark figure, kind of hunched on the ceiling tall with his or her hand on the support column or wall. Its body was shadowy and undefined, but the hand had detail with long pointed fingers, almost had a kind of gloss to it as well, but still had shadows flowing from it. It's appeared solo or lurked where the masses appeared before, like it's the one behind it all. Only once has it ever put its hand on the opposite side of the doorframe though, which is kind of weird. And I yelled and threw something at it that time. If you guys have any ideas on what I'm dealing with here, please let me know because this whole situation is beginning to terrify me. Back in the late 90s and early 2000s, I lived in a very weird house. It had some serious history with what it had been and how it was built. The house itself was built in 1910 and sometime around 1940, the front of the house was expanded with a large storefront style front end added that was turned into a repair shop of some kind. When the expansion to the house happened, they extended the basement. The basement was a long corridor, about 60 feet long, but... This is where it kind of got weird. In the early 60s, it went from being a repair shop to an underground brothel, and the basement had a whole line of rooms on the left side that were big enough for a twin bed and a night table. There were seven rooms like this, each the same as before in design. At the very end of the basement was one larger room, which was about the size of a, a king-size bed, I would say, to give a visual image. Along the main corridor were pillars in the middle of the walkway outside of each room and they all had large loops like you would find for tying up horses or cattle but the house had no history of being a farm based house. In the early 70s though there was a man who managed to kill seven of the working ladies at the brothel and then just ended himself. The city obviously shut it down at this point and it was sold later to be turned into a concert hall in the front storefront area. So, needless to say, the house was interesting at best, but for a bunch of 17 and 18 year olds, it was one of the best places ever to rent. It was a constant party house, but it was ours. The front area we turned into a lounge with a crap load of couches and tables for doing what teens in their first place do best. In the end, the house was paid for by me and three other friends. Before living here, I didn't believe in ghosts or any of that. But after living in that house, 
Even to this day, I don't fully know how to explain the events that occurred, but it all started out when the unexplained things that we just thought were someone else in the house began. So one day, my friends and I were all sitting in the back room of the house when we heard a loud crash. We looked out to see the light in the kitchen strobing and our ferret was screaming who he kept in a cage in the kitchen dining area. But we heard another slam and can see this cage in the light slide past the doorway. We obviously run out to what the hell was going on but when we entered the kitchen there was nothing there. Just our little dude freaking the hell out. We could never figure out what was going on, but when this happened, it got all of us talking about our own events. Over the course of the next few months, we started to gain a feeling for each one of the, well, for a lack of a better term, spirits. They shared the house with us, obviously, and I don't know how to put it, but we felt that there were at least two good warm feeling spirits and one really angry and violent one. We started having physical interactions with them, which to this day I can't fully explain other than that it felt like a warm hand on your shoulder kind of experience. And then the other, which resulted in what looked like burns and scratches. When we lived here, we had a set of three paintings that made up one painting. And when we put them on the wall in the correct order, they would get ripped off the wall sometimes and we would come home to them on the other side of the room and other times it would happen with us watching, like when we were sitting around drinking or whatever else. Now, if we put them up in the wrong order, nothing ever really happened to them. And in the end, they just lived in the wrong order for this reason. But we had a number of stereos in the house too and they would all go to white noise after listening to them. These were the old style with the knobs to change the stations around, so we ended up taping them in place, but they would still sometimes, somehow, go to the white noise anyway. After living here for two years, we gave names to them too. Rose and Jill for the two that we can only assume were two working girls or something. And Henry, the killer we think, we dubbed the mean one that would inflict pain and anger to the rooms. And Henry would also slam doors and cupboards, sometimes would throw plates or glasses. And when we would take showers, the mirrors would show handprints in the condensation and we would hear what sounded like faint women talking when no one else was home. But one night though, my friend and I were throwing a Nerf football back and forth. The ball bounced and hit a large white vase that was in the house when we moved in. It fell over and crashed on the floor into pieces. And we felt like it must have been Henry angry because both of us instantly felt burns and had scratches on our backs. It was the raised world kind of scratches and his activity levels just skyrocketed for the next week or so. I don't really know what brought me to share all of this but in the end it felt uh, therapeutic to tell someone for the first time outside of my friend circle about everything that's happened to us. There were lots of other events that happened too, but this will do for now, and I hope you guys enjoyed this. So, I have two related stories that I'd like to share with you guys. So one time, when I was 12, I was at the mall with my family. My sister wanted to go into one store, and I wanted to go into another. And my dad said, fine, go ahead, we'll be right over here. I went into the shop and was just looking at all the different albums and whatnot. And I specifically remember looking at a White Snake CD, and out of the corner of my eye, I see this man in his 40s, I'd say, come straight towards my way after entering the store. I knew right away, too, just by looking at him, that something just was not right. He stood right next to me and pretended to look at a CD, and moved closer to me after about a minute. I stood there pretending to still look and not make it obvious that I knew what was happening. I played it off and just moved around to the other set of CDs on the other side of the case and was going to make my way out casually, him still pretending to look but watching me. So I casually walked out and as soon as I left I darted to find my dad and everyone else and I looked behind me to see if the guy was still following me. Then I went into the crowd to try and lose him and he was trying to look above the crowd to find me and he caught up eventually but I was headed down the escalator by that time and there I saw my dad and I saw the man leaving into the Macy's. It was the scariest thing that's ever happened to me at the time and I never really told anyone what happened that day. 
I'm a very shy person and quite honestly, after thinking about it for some time, I thought that maybe I was just mistaken. So the next story is when me and my friend, we were both 15 and 16 at the time, female, we were out walking around at night, just kind of goofing around, no big deal. It wasn't extremely late, like 8 or 9 at night. I live in a really safe city, suburbs if you will, so we were just kind of walking around, doing whatever, and where I live there are four neighbourhoods, all right next to each other, two across the street from me, and one right next to my neighbourhood. And there, for some reason, is just a stretch of pretty much no lights. Not a long stretch, but long enough to kind of be a little bit creepy, and then you're at the intersection, and there's a grocery store at the plaza, which is important. So, we make our way around, ran into some guy banging on his door screaming at these people to let him in, and we stopped dead in our tracks and turned around at this point. He didn't see us, but it was definitely weird. He was in a UPS uniform, so, anyway, making our way back, we were walking through the grocery store plaza. I think we went in there for a second to get something and made our way back to the sidewalk back to my house. When I noticed three people at the donation drop-off taking stuff out. Of course, this is where the no lights part begins. I didn't make it noticeable that I see this going on and just kept walking. My friend doesn't think anything of it, but I wanted to keep an eye on them because something just felt off about it. And as soon as we passed them and walked a little way, I looked back to make sure that we weren't being followed and my heart just dropped. I see a figure running after us with a white bag in hand and it was one of them. I told my friend to run and we ran into the neighborhood right next to mine. Ironically enough too, I didn't even think of this at the time, but we could have just hopped the fence of the people that lived behind us and been in my backyard. Since nobody lived in that house at the time but didn't think of it at that moment... So we ran around this neighborhood and made a loop and now we're afraid to leave because we weren't sure if these men were hiding somewhere to snatch us or what they were doing. So we walked out of the neighborhood in the middle of the entrance and walked into the middle of the street, walked down a little and got onto the sidewalk again just to make sure that he couldn't grab us if he was hiding up somewhere. I look behind me and we see this guy chasing us again and at this point we just ran. My neighborhood was right there, but I was so scared of him following me to my house that I made a couple of loops. I think we eventually lost him, and we ran so fast just straight into my house and hid in my room for the rest of the night. Everybody was home, of course, so we felt safer, but still, I think it was a close call. So, I grew up in my teens in a big city. And if it matters, I'm also white and male. Well, while in junior high, I only had a few friends, but was by no means shy or reclusive or anything. Just an average boogerhead, I suppose. While outside on a lunch break, I was walking by the monkey bars. A couple of girls were sitting on the chin-up bars off to the side. As I passed, one of the girls started talking to me. It was normal questions like, who are you, what grade, age, etc., one of the girls made to spin down or slipped or something, but she was hanging upside down by one knee. She locked her leg in a similar position and turned loose with her hands. Her shirt slid right down over her head and she was fully exposed since her bra didn't fit right. Everyone was laughing and looking, but no one was helping. And no one noticed the issue that I could plainly see. So I grabbed her shirt and pulled it up to cover her, helped her down and walked with her to the building. I figured that it was a good deed done and that would be that, but not quite. So after school, she was waiting for me, and out of nowhere, she gave me a hug and then kissed me on the mouth. I pulled back because I don't know this person and I don't want to get involved. I guess though that she was offended and she asked me what was wrong, never been kissed by a black girl. I told her no, but that was not the problem. She asked what the problem was and... I truthfully told her that I didn't remember her name and I didn't know her. She laughed and said that it was Letitia. And then we said goodbye so that I could catch the bus. The following Monday, Letitia is waiting for me at lunch. She tells me that she never did thank me for saving her. I told her not to worry about it. It's cool and we walked around the soccer field and 
Then she stops me with her hand and says, my mum wants to meet you. I ask her why and she tells me that she told her mum what happened and now she wants to meet me. She goes on to say that she's picking me up so that you can meet her then. And then we go back to our classes. Now, I was never really academically inclined so now the whole damn day just will not move along. School ends and after dragging my butt I meet Letitia. We walk to the parking lot and she gets all happy and says there's mum. We walk over and her mum gets out of the car and gives me a hug. I'm internally losing my crap but she says how good it is to meet me, how nice I was to have been there for her daughter and then she says you must come home for dinner. I start making excuses about my parents and whatnot, don't like me out after school nights and so and so and she says don't worry it's all taken care of, I already called your mum. And then she says dinner tomorrow night at 6. They get in the car and I get on the bus just kind of scratching my head. As soon as I get home, I say to my mum, why did you say yes? And she replies with that it'll apparently be good for me to meet other people and girls. I had visions of telling her, oh I've met her alright, seen some stuff too. But in the end I just kind of accepted it all. The next day just sucks and it takes forever and at the same time it jerks forward at warp speed at the end. Lunch break truly sucked. Letitia had told everyone that I was going to her house for dinner. Oh, and to meet my dad. I walk back to the building and spend the rest of the school day planning my escape while answering questions about dinner. Like, what's for dinner? The day ends without me having a plan and she walks me to the bus since her mum isn't there yet and then she tries kissing me again. I get home, not saying a word to anyone and I just go to my room. My mother pops her head in and tells me to change for my date and goes back to what she's doing. She drives me over and says that they'll be bringing me home and I say, Oh no, you come and get me. I don't know these people and I don't know why I'm going, why I was invited or anything to begin with. You come and get me mum or I'm not going. She agrees and tells the Tisha's mother that she'll pick me up and they agree on a time and my mum leaves. I meet her three brothers, her two sisters, a cousin and a grandmother, and everyone's pretty cool. Well, one brother keeps giving me a stink eye, but there's nothing I can do about that, so I just ignore it. I thought that maybe, just maybe, I could hang out with the three brothers, even the one with the stink eye, but that did not happen. I end up sitting next to grandma, which was cool because Letitia is hovering, and after about 15 minutes of nothing conversation, her dad comes home. And this man is huge. He stands up to me as I stand, thinking about running to be honest, and he smothers my hand in his. He says, so you're the boy who's seen and rescued my daughter. He asked me a couple of questions that I just nodded or shook my head to. My mind is screaming at me to talk and he says, take a seat. So I did. He spoke for a while telling me that interracial relationships were difficult at best. I can feel my neck twisting around to look at Letitia while he says that at the most you can expect a little hostility. She walks over and sits above me on the arm of the couch. I'm looking at her dad and then her and kind of over and over again. And then she reaches out and takes my hand. I finally find my words and whisper, what did you tell them? She laughed and said, just that we're girlfriend and boyfriend. I didn't mention the other thing that we did. And at this point, I was like, hell no, you kissed me. Her dad stops talking and is just kind of looking at us. Her grandmother, having sat right there the whole damn time, turns and adjusts her seat on the couch so that she can too look at us. I'm turning red, embarrassed, but also getting pretty angry. And her dad says, what thing? And at that point, I just told him that she kissed me. And it came out as an accusation. He looks at me and then looks at her and he takes a deep slow breath and says, well, maybe you two will make it. And I was like, what? And then he said, when the two of you are old enough and if you still want to, I'll give you my blessing. And at this point, I was pretty angry, so I said, blessed for what? And he says that you'll marry my daughter. 
I'm stunned and I'm having a major brain fart. I snap out of it when she starts sliding down the arm like she's going to land on me. I popped up and I was straight out of that damn door. I'm running and I get home to an empty house. I go to my room and lay on my bed. The phone rings and I go into the kitchen and answer it. It's my neighbor. He asks if I'm okay and I say that I am and he tells me that my mum is out driving the streets looking for me. She got a call that I had left in a rush and everyone was worried. I said that I was fine and hung up and I turned on a lamp in the living room to show that someone was home and I just went to bed. The phone rings again and I return to the kitchen, then I answer and then I hear, You will marry my daughter. It was a dad and I am not doing this. I'm not doing the phone games again, so I say, Sir, I wouldn't marry your daughter for all the tea in China. And he says, You will marry her. I said, I don't know what she's told you, I don't know if she's crazy or if you are, but I am not, repeat, not marrying her or anyone else. I helped her and she kissed me. I didn't even know her name. We're not dating, we have never dated and we never will. He got quiet for a bit after this and then he said, is what you just said true? I replied, every damn word. And then he tells me to watch out for his sons until he can come collect them. He then hangs up. The brothers then announce themselves with pounding on my front door. I start gearing up with multiple sweaters and two pairs of blue jeans. I get my bat ready and walk into the living room. I look out the bay window and they're still there. I look at my dad's gun rack but don't grab one. I know that they're loaded. I do mentally select the weapon that I will use if anything else goes down but the banging then stops. I look out the window again and the neighbor is talking to the brothers. While I'm watching, my mum pulls into the drive and then their father pulls up. My mum then goes to talk to them and I can picture her telling them all to come in. After a minute or two, she comes in and says, are you okay? I say back to her, mum, was this some kind of joke or a prank? Please say yes. And she walks over and hugs me and says, no. Son, you did a good thing at school and don't let this stop you from doing the right thing again. She continued with, I'm sorry, I had no idea. I went to my room where I just sat there and I don't even remember what I was thinking. And to this day, almost 40 years later, I just shake my head when this memory returns. I don't know what those brothers were planning to do to me and what she told them, but they were pretty angry and they were looking for any excuse to get me.